Thank you, Pastor Derek, for uh, those kind words of confidence. I appreciate that. And uh, today we continue uh, looking at uh, the Gospel of John. Uh, we've been in a series entitled The Son of God, and we've been watching Jesus uh, heal people. We've been watching him uh, eventually that healing, especially on the Sabbath, got him in trouble with the Jewish leaders, uh, which last week we got into a little bit of that conversation, and today we're going to get into more of that, mostly of Jesus speaking as he rebuttals them in their thoughts and about who he was and uh, his claim. But today we're going to talk about uh, Jesus shares equality with God. If he is the Son of God, that is something that he claims to do, is to share equality with God. And we're going to be in John chapter 5, verses 18 through 24. So if you'll turn there in your Bibles, and as you're doing that, uh, I want to tell you about a time up uh, up in New York City. Uh, it was in the 1840s, and during that decade, uh, New York was uh, beginning to be a growing, bustling city. Uh, it was during the Industrious Revolution uh, in America time where there were tycoons beginning, beginning to be uh, strong in the American business. And uh, New York, if you went on the city, out in the city and walked in Broadway and those different streets and places, you would find it very busy. You would also find it a place where there would be gentlemen and, 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 and ladies dressed up and going about their business. You would also find it a place where business was even done right there on those uh, streets. Uh, they were, it was done just with a word and a handshake a lot of times. And it was a, uh, it was a, it was an era of good feeling and a prosperity that America was, was going somewhere. So a lot of people just kind of fell into that. And one particular man that did fall into that and made good use of it for his pocket was a guy by the name of William Thompson. William Thompson went around New York City for about 10 years and stole people's pocket watches. Now, he didn't steal them in the way we would think he would steal them. We would, he didn't come up and, you know, swipe them as they weren't looking or anything like that. He simply would go about his business this way. He would dress very gentlemanly, like he was, you know, one of the crowd out there. He would walk up to uh, what he would say a mark or a person that was dressed very richly and, and, and gentlemanly as well. He would strike up a conversation and just kind of make small talk and try to lead that person to the point of believing that he knew him. He was somebody from his past, maybe even a family member or a, a long lost cousin or something. And as they talked, he finally, as they got to the end of the conversation, he would give them these three words, which were a question, and it was his scam. They were simply, have you confidence in me to trust me with your pocket watch until tomorrow? Now, you and I today, we, would, we wouldn't have any problem with that. We're not going to give anybody we don't know something that we have as full possession. But in that time period, that was a very, a very common thing, especially for people of the higher classes. They, they would do that, and he thought it was kind of a joke. And so the man kind of laughed a little bit and then looked at him and said, yes, and he gave it to him. And, of course, William Thompson walked away laughing. Tomorrow came, and William Thompson didn't come back. <laughs> He had moved on. He did this for about 10 years until finally in 1849, he stole a watch from a Mr. McDonald. That was a, a gold lever pocket watch worth about $110 at that time. In today's time, it'd be about $4,000. So very rich individual, nice watch. But he made the mistake of being seen by him two or three days later, in which the policeman, he called a policeman, the policeman ran and caught uh, William Thompson, who went by many aliases, by the way. He had this scam down really good. And they caught him, arrested him, took him in, and took him down to the, uh, to the jail, put him in there, and put a notice up, and basically said, if, if you have entrusted your pocket watch to this confidence man, the man who always used that word, then you may come to, your police, to the police station and, and try to get it back. Interesting, he was called that, the confidence man, because that's what he used. He bought people's confidence or tried to get their confidence and then made that scam happen, able to take their pocket watch. Confidence man eventually got shortened to what we know as what? Con man. Yeah, con man. Uh, 
and uh, books have been written by it. People have developed it, uh, but that's how that came. And it was the claim of his basically misleading people that you can trust me. Uh, you can trust me with your watch, and I'll, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. Do you trust me that I'll bring it back? That was how he tricked people. That's how he got a load of watches, and um, he put out a claim. Jesus claimed things all the time, and with the religious leaders, as he came before them, that's what he had. That's what they accuse him of in our text today is making a claim that they felt was blasphemous. They felt nobody can claim to be the Son of God. Nobody can claim in that way to be God, as we'll see in our studies. And today we live in a world, and especially politics, where we have misinformation. We have disinformation, which is actually prepared and made to be misinformation. And we're constantly checking facts, you know. Uh, if you watch the debate this week or any of the times they have the president or others speaking, there's constantly uh, a fact checker working on that, trying to, to do research. And there's actually companies that do this. One company actually has uh, a scale, which they call the Pinocchio scale. I thought that was good. Uh, and if you tell one lie, if a candidate tells one lie, it's like one Pinocchio and then so many lies. And the worst is, is like a four Pinocchio, and that means it's a whopper, and you really know it. And so uh, that's kind of what was coming across to these religious leaders who in their day, like Pastor Derek was talking about us protecting the doctrines of the Bible and trust, that was what they thought they were doing, except they were protect, protecting a lot of their traditions more than they were the Word of God. Uh, they had given up on looking deep and studying it, and they had simply clung to those traditions. So when Jesus says what he does, and he heals that man, and it's on a Sabbath, and then they accuse him of being equal with God, they're basically saying, Jesus, you just told us a whopper. You have lied. This is not correct. And so today, that's where we are. You know, did Jesus really claim to be God? Did he really share equality with the Father? Or was he lying about that? Or was he even maybe crazy and made that up. So we're going to look at that today, and I want you to look in uh, John chapter 5, 18 through 24, and I'll read this uh, through the English Standard Version, this service. It says in verse 18, This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing on his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the father loves the son, and he shows him all that all he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel." For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for your word today. And I pray that many and those that are sitting here today, Lord, they have trusted you and they understand, God, who you are. That as you were here on earth, you were truly, truly God, truly man. Father, I pray that uh, they will continue to mature in their faith and grow, Lord. There's some, God, that are here this morning and they may claim to be Christians and, and believe that you've saved them, but they've never wrestled with this or really thought about this powerful doctrine that you are indeed God. Not just someone created, not just a good man that did a great job living and dying for us, but you're God. I pray that you would mature them in their faith and, and help them continue to grow. And Lord, there are those that... Uh, Lord, that um, just are, are unbelievers 
And God, they may be here this morning and, you know, religion to them, Lord, maybe something they question, maybe something that they're tired of and fed up with. Lord, I pray that you would show them this is not about religion, that it's about a relationship, Lord, with, with you through your son, Jesus Christ, who you sent to us to die for our sins, to be resurrected for our life, and Lord, to have a kingdom that is everlasting. Lord, thank you for your recorded word that John wrote down to show this powerful uh, rebuttal and speech that Jesus gives to the Pharisees and the religious leaders, the Sadducees, who were questioning God, his claim of deity. And we ask this in your name today, we pray. Amen. Many in that day, as the Jewish leaders and others thought that, you know, Jesus was a charlatan. He was somebody that just somehow made things happen and, and claimed this. Today in America, we, if we took a poll, which Lifeway did, 51% believe that he was first and greatest being that God created. So uh, they would fall much in line, maybe with uh, some of the other uh, what I would call cults, Jehovah Witnesses or Mormons or others that simply believe that Jesus was created. Something along those lines is when you come to evangelical Christians, it's just a little smaller percentage than that as well. So we have people that even within our churches have not come to grasp a powerful doctrine that Jesus shared and preached and the Bible uplifts, and that is that Jesus is deity. He shares equality with God the Father. So is Jesus making this claim? And if so, is he telling the truth? And if the truth, if it is the truth, how does that affect you and me today? It's a big question. You know, because if he is God, then we should live every day in a great and awesome fear of our relationship with him, with right great respect and following him. If he's not, then we should put it completely away from us. Those who worshiped him uh, with no record that he told them to stop. There were people that did that, and he never told them to stop. The wise men came and worshiped him. The disciples worshiped him when he calmed the storm or he walked on the water. Um, also, Thomas, we know, worshiped him. When he realized that he really was who he said he was, resurrected from the dead, he fell at his feet and said, Lord and God, that's who you are to me. Lord and God. <clears throat> and then not only that, uh, even after the resurrection, there were uh, the women at the garden tomb that worshiped him. And those gathered before his ascension worshiped him. So he, he had people worship him just as he were God, but he never said, don't do that. He never said, don't do that. His own claims, he shared glory with God, he said, before creation. He commanded angels. He forgave sins. We saw that just a week or two ago. He claimed to be sinless. He represented the Father. He said, to hear me is to hear God. To, hear me, to see me is to see the Father. Whatever you're seeing me do, that's what the Father would do. And then also he had authority over the law. He would tell them what the law meant or how they should interpret it as well and that it all pointed to him. So because of what Jesus says and because of what he does, he shares equality with God because of what he says and what he does. So let's look at that today. First, claim number one, what Jesus says. First of all, he is the only begotten son of God. Jesus states this in the book of John where he was talking to these uh, religious leaders in chapter 5 and 18. It says that they were mad at him because he broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal to God. To say a statement like that would mean that he was part of deity. That's their interpretation of it. Matter of fact, they would say, well, it's okay to say our father. Jesus taught us to say that when we pray the Lord's prayer, but you're in no place to say he is your father. That, that, that was just unheard of by the Jewish leader. Nobody is that close to God. And yet Jesus said, my father, so many times, prayed to his father, called him his father so many times. 
In John 3, verse 16, Jesus himself said he was the only begotten son of God, the only begotten son from him. The Nicene Creed was made in 325 AD, and it was basically came about because there was an argument in the church as to was Jesus created and simply a man that God blessed and poured his spirit out on, or was Jesus really God? Was he part of God himself, part of that trinity? And this is what they came away with saying, we believe in one God, the Father, all governing, creator of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son, begotten of God, begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not created, of the same essence as the Father, through whom all things came into being, both in heaven and in earth, who for us came down and was incarnate, becoming human, suffered, and the third day rose, ascended to heaven, and will come to judge both the living and the dead. That's a powerful statement. They want to make very clear that people knew Jesus was not just a created man, that God blessed, and he did a lot of good things. He wanted to make sure that people didn't come away with going, well, he's a great prophet, one of many. Or uh, they wanted to make sure that he was not just thought of as a great moral teacher. No, he's beyond that. He is God. He is God of God, light of light, as it says, begotten, not created. And then also he was preexistent and self-existent. In John 8, 58, Jesus is talking to, again, the religious leaders, and their claim is about Abraham, and Abraham is their father, and they're part of Abraham, and Jesus tells them basically that you just can't trust in that. And then he gives them this whopping statement. He says, before Abraham was, I am. Now, today, if we heard that, we can't, you know, we'd be a little bit like the religious leaders. What if somebody in your family or a friend or somebody you know came up and told you they were here before Abraham Lincoln lived? You'd probably go, okay, let's go on down to the crazy house down there and see if we can get you some help. But he said this. He said, I, I am. I was here. But I, was, I was before. I preexisted before Abraham even came into being. You see, they, they took their religion and the, of the Jewish people back to Abraham. That was who they had pride in. That was where they traced everything. But Jesus, he could go beyond Abraham, even beyond Adam and his creation, all the way back to time, eternity with God the Father himself. And then he used that statement. He said, I am. It's the same words that we find in Exodus 3, 14, where Moses asked God and says, if I go down and face the Pharaoh and try to tell these children of Israel to follow me, who am I going to say told me to come? And Moses, God tells Moses, you tell them that I am sent you. A very uh, much a, a verb in our or in our language, uh, that simply means being, a state of being. In other words, I've always been and I always will be. The first and the last. He will always be eternal in that way. And Jesus made several statements in the book of John that are I am statements. He said, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door for the sheep. And I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the true vine. So he is preexistent and self-existent. Also, he comes from heaven. Mark 14, 61 through 64 is, is a place in which the Jewish leaders have arrested Jesus. They're questioning him. They are uh, whipping him and torturing him as much as they can. And they keep asking him, are you the Christ? And he's silent. But then finally, they ask him one more time, and he says, I am. And then he quickly turns to a very prophetic thing. He said, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds in glory. Now, where did he get that from? It's from the Old Testament. It's from the book of Daniel, chapter uh, 7, I believe it is, in verse 13. 
And that comes at the conclusion of Daniel uh, having this vision of all the different kingdoms of the world, the, the Greeks and the Persians and the Romans, and then finally ending it saying, but in the end, there'll be one like the Son of Man who comes on the clouds and he will, be, he will have an everlasting kingdom. Looking ahead to Jesus, looking ahead to seeing God and who we would know here on this earth, the man Jesus So he comes from heaven. He also told Nicodemus that, that he came from heaven and he would ascend back to heaven. That's how salvation would come apart, or come about, he told Nicodemus. But not only what Jesus says, but also what he does. Look in verse 19, it says, Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. See how close that is? And if you read Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, it's a constant closeness. I'm in the Father. The Father is in me. Constantly he talks about this, being of the, of the same essence. Good word for that is synchronized, or he's in sync with his Father. Next week, we'll have the opportunity to watch the Summer Olympics in Paris. And one of those events that they'll be having is called synchronized diving. Pretty amazing sport. You take a, a diver, which is already pretty amazing to me that somebody's crazy enough to, to jump like that or dive like that and do all the twists and somersaults and things they can do and, and dive and try to make this small splash of water. But now you take two, a pair, and they have to do the same dive and be as close as they can together to earn points from the judges. Going about 30 miles an hour, by the way, in a little over a second and hitting the water. Now, how do they do that? How do they plan for that? Well, of course, they practice, but then when they come together and they decide on their teammate and what they're doing, it takes a few things. It takes, first of all, adaptability. You have to adapt. That other person may not do the dive quite like you, so you have to decide between yourselves which of the way we're going to try to do this. And, of course, you also have to have somebody physically kind of like you, about the same size and those kind of things. And then also it takes trust and focus. You have to be willing to trust this other person is going to try to do exactly what you do so that you can pull off this great sports uh, event. And then finally, it takes communication. And of course, they, they know what they're going to do, but when they get to the, to the platform, one man from the USA that was asked about it, he says, what, what's the routine you do? And he said, well, we come to the platform, and I look over at him, and I tell him what dive we're doing, and we've practiced it, we've done it, so he knows it. And then I'll just simply bump fists with him, and then I'll say, let's go. Very simple communication. Think about that with the Father and Jesus. They are so in sync, so in sync. They know the mind of each other, and God just simply says, do this, and Jesus does this when he's on the earth. So he's in sync with the Father. He also demonstrates the power of his Father. John 5, 20 says, For the Father loves the Son, and he shows him all things and that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Think about all the things that he did, how he healed people, how he made the blind to see, made the lame to walk. He did so many things. He forgave sins like only God could do as well. And then also he says he'll do greater things. That would be raising people from the dead. He hasn't done that yet in the Gospel of John, but he will eventually. He'll raise Jairus' daughter. He'll also raise uh, the widow of Nain's son, who, by the way, is in a procession going to be buried in his coffin when Jesus steps and touches the coffin and calls the boy to come up and he comes back to life. And then perhaps the greatest one in Scripture that we know is Lazarus. He'll call his name. He'll call him forth out of the tomb, and he'll, he'll come walking out of that tomb. He says, I'm going to do greater things that you'll see. Also, not only with that, but closely related, he does what no one else will ever do on their own, and that is resurrection. 
And there's a lot of great people and, that have lived and, and walked on this earth and, and had great causes, uh, great lives. But no one, no one has ever died and rose again except Jesus. And no one ever will because that's what he has decided, God's decided the plan was for him, to die for our sins, to rise for us that we may have life. Look at John 5, 21, for as the Father raises the dead and he gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. He gives the power to do it. And Jesus, by the way, said, uh, no one takes my life from me. He said, I lay it down. And interestingly enough, he said, I can take it back up. Jesus is the one that brought about his resurrection. And so we see that in that. Also, we have the testimony, especially in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul talks about all the people that saw him, himself seeing the revelation of him, talks about how he first showed himself to Peter, later to James. And at one point he says, even over 500 witnesses, 500 eyewitnesses, uh, Derek was talking to me about this a little bit in between messages, and he said, uh, you know, I'd heard somebody say that if you put the math on that and you try to do that, if you were to have, a, say, a week's worth of courtroom and you had 500 witnesses come in and everyone got five minutes, you would have about a week's worth of that. Think of that going, some of you that have been to court and you've sat on jury, think about going to court for a solid week, and every day you go, every minute of that trial from Early in the morning to late in the afternoon, there's a witness constantly saying, yes, I saw him, yes, I saw him, yes, I saw him, yes, I saw him. By the end of the week, what would be your verdict? Yes, <laughs> there's no way. Today, you know, we come find people guilty or innocent, sometimes based on one, two witnesses at the most, 500 witnesses, which by the way, Paul says in his text, he mentions, he said, and some of them are still alive. In other words, you can go ask them. Some of them are still alive. You can even go ask them in his time period, in his day. He also administers justice for his father. John 5, 22 says, For the father judges no one, but he has committed all judgment to the son. Now we talk about meeting our maker, meeting God, God judging us. But here we're told very specifically that judgment is given to the son, to Jesus. That he will... He came and saved us, but also he'll be coming in judgment as well. Why? Well, probably because he's the God-man. He's the one that came down from God and is like us. He lived our life yet without sin, and perhaps because he is what our salvation depends on, confession of who he is. And also he's the one also that many reject. When you read Revelations, it talks about that, that when he appears again, every eye will see him, even those that pierced him and rejected him. Revelations 20 talks about how the dead will be raised and they will come from the land and also the sea and they will come before him for judgment. And those names not written in the Lamb's book of life will be cast away from him. So then he comes to the end of it in verse 23, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. In other words, Jesus ties this close relationship to his Father. If you don't accept me, then you really don't accept God. If you accept God, you can't say that you don't accept me. The question is today, are we going to be ones that honor God by honoring Jesus as well? Or we want to try to split those two, and we're just not sure about it. Matt, uh, Matt, Josh McDowell was an apologist and still is, still does some of uh, that work, but he's, his day was much greater years ago. And um, he grew up, and in a book called uh, More Than a Carpenter, he tells his story. He grew up... Uh, in Michigan, in that area, the Midwest, sort of. And he, he went and he worked uh, in a farm and did all the things that you do in that kind of life. And most people in his area went to church, so he went to church. And he was a person that kind of grew up wanting meaning, wanting purpose out of life, wanting to be happy. And he thought, well, that's, what, that's where I, I get being happy. I go to church. And he went to church and went to church and went to church. And 
That didn't make him happy. That didn't give him purpose or meaning at all. Matter of fact, he would later tell one of the people at his university he was fed up with church, fed up with religion. So he left that, and then he went to school, university, and he thought education and intellect, that's really what I, I need. That'll make me happy. That'll make me what I need to have, be prestigious. And he did that, and that didn't. Finally, he saw a group of people who were smart and intellect, about eight people, uh, students and a couple of faculty members that met and sat together. And he began to sit with them and didn't know really what they were about other than the fact that they seemed to like each other and they seemed to like everybody else or treat them nice and everything. He said, I, I want to see what that's about. So he sat with them. And the more he sat with them, the more he heard them talk about religion or Christianity. And one day when they said that, he said, you don't believe that stuff, do you? That's just a myth, Jesus rising from the dead. And then he said he was fed up with religion, to which one of the girls in the circle looked at him and said, it's not about religion, Josh. It's about a relationship. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. I am who I am, and I'm changed because of Jesus Christ. And she dared him, challenged him to research and look into it himself. And so he did. He was that type of, of, of guy with uh, intellect and uh, a quest to find out uh, truth. And he did. And the end result was he came to faith in Christ. And he said, quoting uh, C.S. Lewis, he said, basically, we have a trilemma. We know what a, a dilemma is. That's when we have two choices we have to make between one. And people say, I'm in a dilemma. A trilemma, you have three possible ones, he says. And he says this in his book, More Than a Carpenter. He says, you cannot put him on a shelf, talking about Jesus, merely as a great moral teacher or prophet. That's not a valid option. In other words, Jesus doesn't give you that option. We could create that option, but that he doesn't give us that option. He says he is either a liar. In other words, he made all this up maybe even sent from Satan to do it, to deceive us. He's a liar. Or maybe worse than that, poor, poor man, he was a lunatic. He just was crazy. Or the last deal, he's really the Lord. And that's our choices. He is the liar, a Lord, or a liar, a lunatic, or a Lord. That's a choice we have to make. For the unbeliever today, it's to think on these claims and ask, what do I need to do? How do I need to make a decision about who Jesus is? Is he really God? That's what we've studied today. That's what the Bible has shown us by what he said and what he did and throughout history to change lives. For the immature or lapsing believer, it's to strengthen your doctrinal belief, to become stronger in what you believe. Just knowing some of the scriptures I mentioned that are there in your guide and being able to take those and, and remember them and maybe even witness or share them to others. To the mature believer, it's to appreciate knowing what God, God did for you. This wasn't just a man that made this up and, and was a good man and gave himself to a good cause. This was God that drew up this plan and brought it down to us because he loves us because he wants and desires relationship for us, with us. He, he wants to remove the sin that is a barrier between us. And that came through his son, Jesus Christ. Our choice then must be made. Will you honor the son and pass from death to life? What a wonderful phrase. Go from headed to death. Nothing good about this world, or even the world to come. Or are you headed to life? which means you can have abundant life, as Jesus said, right now, joy and steadiness in your life. And you can eventually have eternal life beyond the grave, resurrected with him, because he is the resurrection and the life. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And if you have a decision to make today, maybe you've never accepted Christ, I want to invite you to come do that. We can talk with you and share with you how to do that. Maybe as a believer, you just need to rededicate your life. You need to, to uh, rededicate to learning more about the doctrine of Christ and God and who he is. Maybe you need to join this church, become a part here.
God's leading you to do that, then I invite you to come do that. Or maybe something totally not even that we preached about or talked about today. Something's on your heart and your mind, and you want to come to the altar and pray. I want to encourage you to do that. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we'll have our invitation Him. Dear God, I thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to share your word. Thank you for putting it on my heart throughout the week and developing it, God. And Lord, I just pray that uh, we would look toward you, God, and know that you, through Jesus, uh, it, you are the God man that has come down to save us from our sin. No one else could do it. We couldn't earn it on our own, as we've talked about earlier, through our singing. But Lord, you had to do it for us. And Father, just help us to embrace that and to not let pride or anything else get in the way, but to simply trust you and accept you and worship you, honor you and honor your son that we might pass from, from death to life. We ask these things in your name. We pray, Jesus. Amen.